Juan for the introduction. Um, and thanks, of course, to Lucia, Juan, and Manuel for the, for the invitation. Um, and also for, I think I can say, as uh, since I was helping to organize the seminar at the very beginning, I should also thank them for doing such an excellent job uh, running the seminar uh, for, I guess, over a year now. Um, it's been really great. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, sort of two projects, one with Bira Her and one with Susanna Haziot, that are both somehow about uh, waterways with constant vorticity, and in particular, waterways with constant vorticity, where the surface of the wave, somewhat bizarrely, uh, isn't a graph. Okay, so let's start off with just what the equations are. Uh, I know a lot of people in the audience are sort of experts on this, uh, but I also just want to fix uh, notation. So. We have, uh, oh, I forgot to ask, can you see my cursor? Yes, thank you. Um, so we have a fluid region, let's say water, here in blue, um, and it has two different boundary components. So there's a bottom boundary, which is kind of boring. It's just a flat impermeable bed. So think, you know, the bottom of the ocean or the bottom of your river or canal. Uh, the fluid particles just slide back and forth along it, and it's fixed. And then we have a more interesting boundary component, the free surface, which is a model for an interface between our fluid, the water fluid, and some other fluid, say air. Um, and we're going to have a detailed model of the water, but a very crude model of the air, which you can justify in various ways. OK, so in terms of the geometry, everything today is going to be 2D. And we're really, really heavily going to lean on the fact that it's 2D. Um, X is always going to be the horizontal variable. Y is always going to be the vertical variable. Um, and in these first few slides, I'm also going to have little u and little v, which are just the velocity components of the velocity field, which is pushing all of these fluid particles around. Um, I also need some notation for these two boundary components. So let's call the bed y equals minus d. So d is some reference depth, maybe an average depth or a depth at infinity of the fluid. And then for the surface, because I want to explicitly allow um, for waves where the surface isn't a graph, I have to give a parametric representation. So let's say C is the parameter that moves you along the surface. And then, of course, this whole surface is also moving in time. So everything also depends on T. OK, so in terms of the PDEs inside the fluid, we're solving the incompressible Euler equations. Oops, we're solving the incompressible Euler equation. So just here written out in components. So we've got the uh, X momentum equation and the Y momentum equation, you know, F equals MA for the fluid particle motion, where the force on the right hand side comes from the gradient of the scalar function P, the pressure, and then there's also gravitational forcing, importantly. And then finally, we've got incompressibility. So here, I'm assuming um, that the fluid is incompressible, and I'm also sort of implicitly assuming that the density has been normalized to one. Um, there's certainly a lot of interest uh, in the same problem where you keep incompressibility, uh, but allow variable density, but I'm not going to talk about that problem at all today. Okay, so now on to the boundary conditions. So these come in two flavors. The first boundary conditions are called kinematic boundary conditions, and they're called kinematic boundary conditions because they're just statements about what fluid particles on the boundary do. And what they do is they stay on the boundary. So if you start a fluid particle off on the surface, it's going to stay on the surface for all time and the same for the bed. And so you, to get derive these boundary conditions, you essentially just plug in this fact in two ways. So, you know, it stays on the surface, so it has to always be given by this uh, parameterization. Uh, but you also know that it's being pushed around by this velocity field. And so if these two things are simultaneously true, you use the chain rule a few times and you get something that looks like this. It's much easier actually to see on the bottom where this is just saying that the vertical component of the velocity field is zero. So the velocity is purely horizontal. And so the fluid particles are just getting pushed back and forth. Just, just a moment. What is UV? The, the array UV, what does it represent, please? Uh, so, so the fluid particles, so say X comma Y is, the, is a fluid particle. It okay. solves the ODE X dot is U and Y dot is V. And U and V depend on X and T. Okay. Does that make sense? Thank you. No problem. Great. And so we've got one more boundary condition, the dynamic boundary condition, which is somehow about the balances of balance of forces between our fluid region that we're tracking and this sort of other region above that we're not thinking too hard about. And uh, essentially, it's a Laplace Young law for the jump in the pressure between the two fluids. But our model for the upper fluid is just that it has constant pressure. And so what we end up getting is just a, uh, that the pressure is prescribed in terms of some constant, some say Bernoulli constant or something like that, um, plus some term involving the mean curvature. So here, kappa is the mean curvature of the surface, and t is some non-negative uh, 
co dimensional surface tension coefficient. For almost all of the talk, I'm going to drop ignore this surface tension uh, component, but I need it for the first few slides to give some background. Okay, so that's the full time dependent problem. But now I'm interested in the steady problem, where this whole picture is moving to the right, say, with a constant speed c. And in this new reference frame moving to the right with a constant speed c, I will assume that there's no more time dependence anywhere in the problem. So for instance, the, uh, the domain itself used to depend on some parameter and also on t. Now it just depends on this parameter, this parameterization of the surface. And similarly, I haven't written it here, but u and v and p used to depend on x and y and t, and now they depend only on x and y in this new reference frame. And so where we used to have uh, dt, we used to have t derivatives, we see a bunch of minus c's popping up everywhere. Okay, so now that the domain was well, still unknown, but at least it's fixed and not moving in time anymore. So at this point, I want to introduce the stream function. So because we have an incompressible vector field, there's a, I guess, a vector potential if you were in 3D, but we're in 2D, so vector potentials are very simple. Um, and what you just get is that there's a scalar function psi whose gradient isn't quite our velocity field, but is a rotated version of our velocity field if you sort of uh, trace everything back. And the great thing about this stream function, since its gradient is everywhere perpendicular to the flow velocity of the fluid particles, is that its level curves essentially give us the, the trajectories of the fluid particles. So if these green lines are level curves of psi, then these are then part of fluid particles that start on a green curve must stay on a green curve forever. And in fact, you can, I mean, you can take this much further. You can uh, really think of the stream function as actually the Hamiltonian uh, for the fluid particle motion, if you want. But uh, and not just, but I'm interested in the stream function, not just to make pretty pictures, but also because I just want to reduce the number of dependent variables that I have to keep track of. So obviously, instead of keeping track of u and v, I can just keep track of psi, but it turns out that you can also eliminate the pressure, which was this other unknown function that we had. So this is what you get uh, when you do that. And maybe I won't go through all of the details, um, but, le but let's briefly talk about a few aspects of how you get this. So first off, we were saying that level curves of psi uh, trap fluid particles. Uh, there are these streamlines. And so the, if you think back to what the kinematic conditions are supposed to express, they now uh, are just going to say that the, that the surface and the bed should be level curves of psi. So that's easy. And since psi only appears as a gradient anywhere, uh, we can shift it so that it's zero at the surface without any want of generality. Um, Sorry, can't you uh, explain maybe why, why is there the condition on the surface on the surface of, the, of what appears uh, in the previous in the previous slide or in this yes how is this condition what does it mean which condition why yes yes this one yes oh, oh this one the second this one on the right uh, on the on, on the top on the top of the picture yeah uh, why xi no yes, okay yes, yes, yes. So, so, so this is this is just saying that if i have a fluid particle on the surface it will stay on the surface for all time. And it looks complicated because the surface isn't flat and the surface is moving in time. And so, so if you think, so, so say you have a fluid particle, it's solving that ODE that involves the U and the V. And it also wanted to stay on this parameterized surface here. And so mm. if you just, so, so this sort of gives you, you know, two vectors that have to be parallel or something like that. And then you take some cross product and you get this, this condition here. No, simply, I don't understand why y is multiplied to the derivative of y multiplied to uh, velocity u and x multiplied to v. Yeah, what, I guess uh, it's because I want to say that two vectors are perpendicular and I'm taking a cross product. Uh, um, yeah. Um, no, y is, uh, yes, and u, it's something strange because uh, you, have, you have y component multiply u and x component multiply to v. What it means? It looks like a cross product to me, um, huh? right? So, so I guess, yeah, so actually, so, so wait, so, so x c and y c are giving me the tangent um, to the, are giving me the tangent to the surface mm. and u minus c comma v is giving me the fluid velocity. And I want these oh. two vectors to be parallel. So I take uh -huh, the cross you. product and I ask it to be zero. Thank you, thank you, Understand. No problem. Okay, so let's see. So where were we? So, so now we're here. Um, and uh, so if you take the curl of the two momentum equations, you realize that you can solve them if you make this ansatz. 
um, right? So, so if you assume that the stream function, if the Laplacian of the stream function, which is physically the vorticity, the curl of the velocity field, is functionally dependent on the stream function itself, uh, then you can check that the two momentum equations are automatically satisfied. But it's even better than that. Uh, once you've fixed this function omega, you can actually sort of integrate the momentum equations to get something like Bernoulli's law, and you can use this to eliminate the pressure um, in this dynamic boundary condition in the upper left. So before we had a pressure here, basically up to a sign with the surface tension term. And now we have sort of a Bernoulli's law term. It looks like one, it's sort of a kinetic plus potential energy term. So this looks like one half the speed squared of the fluid particles. And then this is a gravitational potential energy of a fluid particle term. Okay. So I think there's one other thing that I want to talk about here with the basic setup, which is that I could, and I will later, want to let the depth be infinite. So if I want the depth to be infinite, obviously I don't have this bottom boundary anymore to impose a Dirichlet condition on. And so instead what I'm going to do is make is impose some conditions on the velocity field itself at infinity. Um, I haven't been as precise as I, as I probably should here, but, it, but what you essentially want is for all the streamlines to be flat. And typically you also uh, say something about the horizontal velocity, but at the very least you want the streamlines to be flat uh, at infinity. Okay, so let's pause real quick and look at this sort of uh, free elliptic free boundary problem or overdetermined elliptic problem that we have. Um, we've got a bunch of parameters. So in the dynamic boundary condition, we've got gravity G, we've got surface the surface tension coefficient T. Um, inside the fluid, we have this nonlinearity omega of psi that we're sort of thinking of as specified beforehand. And then finally, we have the depth. And since I haven't been careful about non-dimensionalizing or giving length scales or anything, essentially all that matters here is, is the depth infinite or not infinite? Um, so as you can imagine, with sort of all of these parameters and, uh, and even this free function, uh, there's a lot of different cases of this problem that behave quite differently. And I'm not going to be able to give a, a convincing survey. Um, but what I can point you to is this recent survey paper um, from this year, which has something like 270 references, uh, mostly on this pro on sort of versions of this problem. So you can go there for, for a much more uh, exhaustive survey of, of what is known. Um, but I will, I will try and give a very biased um, uh, and very incomplete survey of some of the things that we know about this problem in the next few slides, mostly working up uh, to the papers that I want to talk about towards the end. So what solutions do we have to this problem? Well, if all of the fluid particles are just moving horizontally and their horizontal velocity only depends on the vertical variable, if we have sort of a shear flow as shown in this figure on the upper right, you can check that this automatically solves the steady Euler equations. Um, and so if you wanted more interesting solutions, say that look like waves in a river or a canal, uh, a natural place to start is to try and look for solutions that are small perturbations of this. And so I'm always going to use the phrase small amplitude uh, to describe these waves. So just to, just, just to fix one case, let's consider uh, the sort of most classical case where we've got gravity, and that's really the only effect. Sometimes these are called gravity waves. So we have gravity, but we don't have surface tension and we don't have vorticity. And we're looking for sort of periodic solutions that look like this. Well, this problem has a really long history, um, certainly goes back at least to the 1840s with Airy and Stokes, but, but even back before then. Um, rigorous constructions of these waves uh, were first done in the 20s by Nekrasov and Levi Civita. Um, uh, nowadays, you would you would do this using a local bifurcation theory of some sort, uh, say Crandall Rabinowitz bifurcation from a simple eigenvalue after some appropriate reformulation of the problem. Um, and then skipping over, I guess, of almost a century, um, there's still a lot of interest in these specific solutions. So in particular, uh, their stability. So Bridges and Milka in 1995 uh, were able to give the first rigorous proof of a linear Benjamin Fear instability. Uh, in finite depth. And uh, actually, one of the earlier talks in the seminar uh, was about uh, a extension of this to infinite depth, and, and maybe more importantly, a different way of looking at this question. And actually, in the last few years, there's been a whole bunch of uh, work on this, a bunch of preprints on the archive doing lots of exciting things. Uh, for instance, um, it seems like there's also now an understanding of different classes of instabilities uh, for these waves. And this is just to make the point that even these sort of somehow simplest of non-trivial solutions to the problem are still sort of an active area of research. Okay. Okay, and K in the previous slide there was some K. It is um, mean the curvature of the surface, or what is it? T multiply K. K is a yeah. K was kappa, which was the mean curvature of the surface. Oh, thank you. 
miles if I could quickly. So for the yeah. bifurcation result, what was the bifurcation parameter for the small amplitude periodic waves? Oh, well, so you, you sort of have your choice. I guess um, I, I think many people would fix the period and use the wave speed, some suitably defined wave speed as the parameter, or uh, what you actually might do, what ends up being uh, convenient is you look at the difference between these two constants for the stream function, maybe you use that as a parameter, or maybe you use this parameter here for the dynamic boundary condition as, a, as, a, as your bifurcation parameter. You really have a lot of choices uh, for the parameter to use. And I, do, I honestly don't remember uh, what Nekrasov and Levy-Civita used. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, and you certainly could use the period itself as a parameter if you wanted to. There, there have been some recent uh, preprints, I think, where people do that, uh, not just for local bifurcation, but for global bifurcation. Okay. And so let me quickly say something about another uh, very well studied class of waves. And so these are waves where instead of being periodic in X, they're localized in X, sort of localized perturbations of these explicit solutions. And again, specializing to this case where it's just gravity that's going on. Here are some of the important historical names. Uh, the rigorous, rigorous constructions come later and are more technically sophisticated, essentially because this problem um, is weakly nonlinear, um, more so than the periodic wave problem. So Friedrichs and Hires use sort of a delicate implicit function theorem argument uh, where they use the fact that they know how to solve the KDV, the steady KDV equation. Uh, Beal uses Nash-Moser, uh, Milka uses uh, sort of dynamical systems uh, arguments, sort of uh, center manifold reductions for elliptic equations and cylinders. And then again, sort of skipping over an, an enormous amount of other stuff uh, and focusing on stability. Um, there is a proof of asymptotic linear stability for these small solitary waves, but to the best of my knowledge, nonlinear stability uh, is completely open. Okay. So that was all sort of a preamble because it was about small amplitude waves. And what I want to focus on in this talk are large amplitude waves. And here, somewhat confusingly, the history is almost earlier. The, the, the first sort of uh, serious thing about large amplitude waves are these explicit solutions due to Gerstner in 1802. So this is, you know, 40 years before Airy and Stokes. So these are waves with gravity and vorticity, but no surface tension. And they're explicit in Lagrangian variables, meaning that the, the actual particle paths themselves are explicit uh, rather than the velocity fields as function of X and Y. Um, and for a nice write-up, uh, for really for a nice proof that this this really indeed gives you a solution, you can see this paper by Adrian Constantine in 2001. So let me show you some pictures of Gerstner waves. So here's a relatively mild Gerstner wave. It's relatively small amplitude, and I've drawn one of these streamlines, one of these sort of representative particle trajectories in green. And now I'm going to increase the amplitude a little bit. And the interesting thing, as I increase the amplitude, is that the picture, the bottom part of the picture isn't changing, right? So sort of as I increase the amplitude, these green streamlines just sort of stick around. And that's a very peculiar property that these Gerstner waves have, which is that if I take, say, this relatively big Gerstner wave, and I look at some particle trajectory deep in the fluid, and then declare that this is actually the surface of my wave and throw away everything on top of it, up to sort of redefining my parameters, I still have a solution to the same problem. So there's no physical reason why this would be true. It's just sort of a, a, an interesting mathematical fact that helps you, I think, uh, construct these waves. So what's the tallest Gerstner wave look like? Well, these crests are getting steeper and steeper and steeper, and eventually you get a cusp at every crest, which is a little strange, but if you ask a small child to draw waves, it's maybe not so unlike uh, what they would draw. Okay, so now let's jump over a century and a half later to sort of the next important family of explicit solutions. These are, there are very, really very few explicit solutions. I think this, this slide is essentially it. Um, found by Crapper in the 50s. And so these are sort of the opposite of the Gerstner waves in many ways. So they, instead of having gravity or vorticity, they just have surface tension. Um, they're explicit, not in terms of their flow map, but in sort of a, conf in the conformal mapping that describes the domain. Um, and so, and, and sort of, if you can, if you knew how to, it, it, up to inverting this conformal mapping, you have explicit formulas for everything you could possibly imagine. Um, so I'm going to talk, always talk about the infinite depth uh, crapper waves. There's also, I should mention, a finite depth version of this uh, due to Kinnersley in the 70s using very similar ideas. So these waves too, as I increase the amplitude, have this weird property that if, that you can pick any streamline and declare it to be the free surface and you still get a solution. Uh, but in terms of just qualitatively what the surface is doing, instead of getting steeper and steeper, like it's going to make a cusp, it's getting more and more rounded. Um, and in fact, the the sort of limb as you get to the very end of this curve of solutions sort of two things happen uh, in quick succession. Uh, 
So the first is that the surface ceases to be a graph sort of in these tiny little pockets near the trough. And so I'm going to call waves like that overhanging. And then finally, you sort of can't go any further with these formulas when the two crests actually touch each other. And so they're sort of trapping a little bubble of air over the trough. And if you tried to go further, you'd get sort of nonsensical solutions where the fluid passes through itself, the sort of surface passes through itself. Okay, and what is omega? Omega is the vorticity, so the curl of the velocity field. Ah, okay, thank you. Oops. Uh, you have a question? Yeah, if I could, Miles. So the cusp, how does the cusp of singularity depend on gravity, g? I was thinking of the g to zero limit. Uh, I don't think that, I don't think you can take g to zero um, and keep the cusp. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 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 I think that this is really just a one, I mean, up to up to sort of scaling, this is really a one parameter family of solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't think there are many, basically this this limit is the only limit you can take. Mm -hmm. All right, so what if we didn't want surface tension? Or oh, wait, wait, so, so we've got these explicit solutions. Um, one of the obvious ways to get other exciting large amplitude solutions is by perturbing these explicit solutions. And so this is, there's, a, there's been particularly been a lot of this uh, for the crapper waves. Um, and we're gonna come back to this literature later. So I think it's, I'm gonna say at least a little bit more about it. Um, really the, the first uh, nice paper, the first results on sort of linearizing around Crapper's waves are due to Okamoto and Shoji in the 90s and early 2000s. And they're trying to see if there are secondary bifurcations um, from these Crapper's waves for this pure capillary problem, so not varying any of the other parameters. And they discover that there are no secondary bifurcations. And the way they do this is they linearize, uh, everything's explicit, and so uh, they're eventually able to reduce these linearized equations to messy but still explicit recurrence relations and then somehow analyze uh, what the solutions to these recurrence relations can do. And they're able to show these recurrence relations only have the sort of solutions that you expect. Um, and so they're able to do so that there are no secondary bifurcations. Uh, but for the purposes of this talk, what's more important what's uh, more important is this next paper by Akers, Ambrose, and Wright, where they sort of notice uh, that with a little extra work, Okamoto and Shoji's work uh, basically gives you, you know, invertibility of some linearized operator. And so you can use the implicit function theorem to add in, uh, for instance, a small amount of gravity. So they take these crapper waves, they linearize, and they add a small amount of gravity, they use the implicit function theorem, and they can get new waves. And I think this is the first uh, rigorous existence proof for uh, overhanging gravity capillary waves. So you have both surface tension and a small amount of gravity. Um, but this has since been uh, extended in, in many ways, which maybe I won't talk about in too much detail, too much detail, but in particular, uh, with a bit more care, you can get waves that actually touch and still have the gravity. And you can add in uh, other effects as well. Okay. So, but what about waves without surface tension? Oh yeah, so here I want to say, here the dominant effect is surface tension. But what if we want to look at waves without surface tension? So there, maybe the most famous thing is the Stokes conjecture. So this is the same Stokes from, the, from a few slides ago. And he writes a paper in the 1880s. Um, and in the introduction to this paper, he, he says quite a bit about how he doesn't like Gerstner's solutions, which I think are quite popular uh, with engineers at the time. And one of the objections that he has based on sort of physical arguments is that he doesn't like the, the way that vorticity is in the Gerstner solutions. And he also doesn't like the cusps. Hello, Miles. Yeah, I guess he froze. He feels, yes. I thought it was my connection. Oh. So it's coming back. Yeah. Oops. Sorry about that. I think I lost my connection briefly. No, it's okay. Just share screen again. Um, where did I cut out? Yeah, here. When is he saying about stocks and some uh, solutions that were popular with engineers? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, 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 so he was saying uh, that that instead you should have 120 degree corners and not cusps. Um, and sort of one of the main achievements, I think, of a sort of steady water wave uh, rigorous literature is that there are now proofs that these waves exist. Um, there's no sort of nearby explicit solution to perturb, uh, 
Uh, so the initial arguments are sort of highly non-constructive. They sort of use, they use global bifurcation theory to construct uh, connected sets of solutions or curves of solutions, starting from the small amplitude ones we saw a few slides ago, and then uh, in a series of steps are able to show that these solution curves sort of terminate at exactly one of these extreme waves and with a corner and study its uh, various properties. Um, so there are many, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, nice work on this problem, um, not all of which I've even listed here, and I don't think I have time to, uh, to actually even list all of the uh, things. I think someone raised their hand. Yeah, if I, if I could quickly. So it's a symmetry question. So these waves that you're viewing here, this is in the co-moving frame, Yes. Uh, they look highly symmetric to me. So is this a right or a left traveling wave? Well, you can't tell from the picture, right? And, and you know, we have a Galilean invariance or whatever. So, so to some extent, it doesn't matter um, because the wave is symmetric. We could think of it as going either, either ah, way. See. Um, there Understood. are interesting questions. So one of the many things that, that, I, that is not going to be contained in this introduction and that I also sort of don't remember the literature on perfectly uh, is to what extent are periodic waves a priori symmetric? Uh, we'll see actually in a, in a, in a, on the next slide, I'll answer that question conclusively for solitary waves uh, where I know the literature better. Mm -hmm. So, so wait one slide and I'll tell you more about Thanks. symmetry. Okay. So in fact, let's do it. Let's go to that next slide. So, uh, I remember Javier Gomez Serrano in, uh, Javier Gomez Serrano in his, uh, talk a few weeks ago was talking about rigidity results for rotating vortex patches. I like this terminology rigidity. And so just to sort of show off this problem, um, there are certainly lots of rigidity results for weight for for water waves. Uh, let me show you the ones for solitary waves with just gravity, uh, because this is what I, I know the best. And I think it's actually also perhaps one of the strongest uh, results that we have. So first off, uh, if you have a localized wave, the depth has to be finite, um, regardless of the amplitude of the wave. Um, so the sort of first anyway, so there's a sort of a, a story there, I should probably also be including a paper of soon uh, a bit earlier than Vera Herr's paper in, in 2012, but there's several papers on this. And, and now this is sort of without any sort of if, ands, or buts, the depth has to be finite. Um, and then once you know that the depth is finite, uh, you can, in fact, there's in fact a sharp lower bound on the speed, uh, so-called, you must have what's called a supercritical speed that I, I won't get into. But anyway, this is again, a sort of a, a long story, but now we sort of have a, a unconditional result that says that the speed of a solitary wave has to be above some important threshold. And one of the many reasons that you're interested in knowing that the speed is above this threshold is that it allows you to uh, plug into this very nice moving planes argument by Craig and Sternberg in 1988, where they show that any wave, which is supercritical in this sense, has to be symmetric and monotone. So at least if you're looking at solitary waves, if you're looking at localized waves, then you can have exactly one crest. You can't, for instance, have two two crests, and you can't, for instance, have something with one crest, but it's somehow leaning in one direction or something like that. So for, for, these, in the, for these simple solitary waves, you sort of can't tell which way the wave is going by just looking at a snapshot. Okay, so that was all uh, preamble. Now I want to start zeroing in on the specific class of problem that I want to look at for the rest of the talk. So what we're going to, we're going to keep the surface tension zero. And we're going to keep gravity, but we're going to add in vorticity, but we're going to add in vorticity in somehow the simplest way you could possibly add vorticity. We're just going to add a constant vorticity, but this is still one new parameter. And it turns out that the sign of this vorticity matters So somehow a sign that makes those solutions look one way and a sign that makes solutions look the other way. So let's look at, let's look at the first numerics on this problem from 1985. If you look at the bottom right, it kind of looks a little pointy at the crest if you sort of squint. But if you look at these other ones, the crests are really round in, in this one figure panel from this paper. They look more like the crapper waves than the Gerstner waves. In particular, with this constant vorticity, uh, numerically, they're able to get these uh, solutions whose surfaces are not graphs. Um, here's maybe a better picture from some different numerics a few years later, where you can see sort of a whole family of one with a rounded crest going to one with a really pointy crest. Um, so, so one obvious question, is you know if you sort of look in a canal or the ocean or something you tend not to see these really rounded crests sort of traveling pristinely and perfectly but uh helpfully this paper um has a nice figure here um where they show that uh, like on a beach or something like that uh you can see you can imagine that this sort of as the tide is coming out or whatever you can imagine that this little roll here is relatively steady and relatively two-dimensional, at least for a short amount of time. And certainly it's very rounded. Um, I think we had another, another question. 
Did we? It was, it, was, it was basically, I was surprised at the relative depth of the flute to the height of the wave, but you've got this image which suggests it's not that yeah. unreasonable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, what I don't have a picture of, though, is something like this, which you can also find numerically where instead of just one very rounded crest, you sort of have something with sort of two disky things on top, sort of looks like a snowman. Um, or certainly much less these, uh, I think these are the most recent numerics where they really have a whole zoo of these increasingly uh, complicated uh, looking waves. I think these are, the previous slide was solitary and, and this slide is periodic. So what do we know uh, about this problem uh, from a rigorous point of view? Um, I'm not going to be able to completely summarize things, but let me really try and focus in on these overhanging waves. So I think that the main paper here uh, remains uh, this global bifurcation result by Konstantin Strauss and Barbara Ruka from 2016, where just like in the irrotational case, they try to construct a curve of solutions. And the hope is that at the end of this curve of solutions, uh, we start seeing this interesting behavior from the numerics, for instance. So they have a, a curve of solutions. And at the end of this curve, somehow, either something's blowing up some norm is blowing up, or maybe the surface intersects. Uh, that's certainly one of the things that you sometimes see in numerics. And then there are some other possibilities, which I, which I won't enumerate. Um, and there are, you know, we have, there are many parameters in this problem. Uh, if the vorticity somehow has the good sign, uh, then they're able to show in a later paper that in fact you do get these corners, uh, like we were seeing in that first uh, numerical panel. Um, and if we have time at the end, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some work we did, uh, Susanna Hazio and I did for solitary waves also, uh, in the same vein. And there's also a nice preprint by Eric Valain and Jörg Weber, um, where they are also generalizing this. Sorry, what is parameter S? Parameter S tells me if you have S. It has, it's just a parameter along a curve. It uh -huh. has no, yeah. Uh -huh, okay, thank you. Yep. And, but so uh, one somewhat disappointing aspect of all of these global bifurcation results is that they, they so far, none of them have been able to actually say that these interest, which interesting thing happens. They just say that some interesting thing happens. And so in particular, uh, none of these results will tell you that an overhanging wave with vorticity exists, actually. Um, so what I want to tell you about in the next few slides is, is a proof that these do exist, at least in some very special asymptotic regime. Um, and the proof has nothing to do with global bifurcation. Instead, the proof has to do with a new family of sort of an unexpected, I think is fair to say, new family of explicit solutions to the problem. So just like the crapper waves had zero gravity, these solutions have zero gravity. But instead of surface tension like the crapper waves had, uh, these have constant vorticity is really the only effect that's showing up. So also like the crapper waves, in fact, the, the surfaces are exactly the same as crapper waves, which was how these were discovered, actually. Uh, but everything else about the problem is totally different. So there's no deep physical connection, as far as anyone I've talked to can tell, between these two problems. It's sort of a, a mathematical accident that the surfaces happen to have the same shape. Certainly, if you plot what the flow is doing beneath the surface, it's something completely different. So let's actually just look at that for a second. So here's a relatively small amplitude version of one of these new waves. Um, the phase portrait's quite interesting. You know, we have these saddles and centers and closed orbits and heteroclinics. And also, as I increase the amplitude, I'm not just stacking streamlines on top of each other anymore. I'm really deforming this whole picture. And because um, it's the same, surf, uh, same formula for the surface, at least, as for Crapper's waves, we again get waves that overturn and waves that touch in this new family of explicit solutions. And so I, I'm mindful of the clock, so I'll give a very short version of, of this story. Um, but I think that, that it's, it's interesting that these waves, these are explicit solutions, which were somehow discovered numerically. So Vera Her and Sergei Diachenko were doing numerics and sort of noticed that in some sort of regions of their parameter space, their solutions they were getting didn't just qualitatively look like crapper waves, but they sort of quantitatively looked like crapper waves. And that was just sort of something that they noticed. And so then uh, the next year, uh, Vera and Jean-Marc Vandenbroek uh, looked at this more carefully. And then finally, Vera and I were able to work out uh, essentially the, the residue calculus uh, to show that they really do, you really do have uh, these exact solutions and to find exact formulas for sort of everything under the sun, very much like in the uh, Crapper case. Okay, so I'll skip over the last few bits of the slide, even though they are uh, worth talking about, and just say that the plan is now to get solutions with very small gravity by perturbing these in, in very much the same way uh, that we talk about, uh, in very much parallel way to what was done with the Crapper waves. Um, and so maybe I'll skip over this next slide and just sort of ask you to trust me um, that by standard arguments, uh, because the vorticity is constant, uh, there are sort of standard tricks that end up writing this problem as something just in terms of the conformal mapping. 
So this is sort of a lot to take in and maybe it's not so important. Uh, suppose that we want our conformal domain to be a disk. This is how people tend to describe crapper waves these days. And it's got a, the conformal mapping has a multi-valued part coming from this log and then a single value part, let's call it W uh, for one of a better letter. And then you sort of solve the, the kinematic boundary condition explicitly and you plug into the dynamic boundary condition and you get something that kind of looks like a mess that's on the boundary of the disk, which is getting mapped to the surface of the fluid. Um, but most of these stuff is sort of nice and local and harmless. It's just sort of imaginary parts and derivatives and modulus squareds. The, the subtle term is this Q, which is usually talked about as a commutator involving Hilbert transforms. Um, and what we t really take advantage of here um, in, the, in the next slide, what we're really going to take advantage of is uh, this nice commutator formula for this operator that comes from a uh, paper by Buffoni, Dancer, and Toland. We're actually not studying this problem at all. They're studying an, an irrotational problem without vorticity, but they also somehow encounter this uh, commutator and study it uh, in depth. So um, in that notation, uh, here is the explicit solution. So the conformal map is really quite simple. It's a log plus this rational function with just a single pole. And that's it. And then he's got a parameter A that goes in the numerator and the denominator and sort of magically uh, that makes everything work. And if you sort of plug this in and figure out what this Q term is using the calculus of residues, you discover that this actually does give you a solution for exactly the same parameter values as, crap, as for Crapper, uh, provided you choose the vorticity in this way accordingly. And so I won't say anything more about why in the world this works, um, in part because I don't really have a great answer. But the objective now is to perturb these solutions and to get solutions with zero, uh, to get solutions with small gravity instead of zero gravity. Um, and so what we want to do is linearize the problem. And, uh, and at the end of the day, we really just need to look at the kernel of some linearized operator. And so after some manipulations, uh, using the fact that everything's sort of explicit rational functions, you can get something like this. So the question becomes, can we find single valued holomorphic functions V in the unit disk, which on the boundary of the unit disk satisfy this sort of Riemann Hilbert type condition. So we make some combination of the derivative of this holomorphic function, the holomorphic function itself, uh, its value at minus a, so there's a little bit of non-local locality in here. Then we take an imaginary part and we want that to be zero. So this sort of has a Riemann Hilbert flavor. And then we have some symmetry assumption. And so what Okamoto and Shoji would do at this point is they just do a Taylor expansion at zero since they know they have a holomorphic function and that's how they would essentially get their recurrence relations. But here it's somehow much messier than what Okamoto and Shoji had and the recurrence relations are just truly terrible and we really didn't know what even how to write them down, let alone how to deal with them. And so very quickly, I just want to tell you, just sort of indicate another also quite elementary approach that we took. So if you look at the thing that's inside the imaginary part, because you've got all these rational functions everywhere, this isn't just some old function defined on the boundary of the unit disk. In fact, this can be continued as a meromorphic function inside the unit disk. So now we're talking about the imaginary part of a meromorphic function. And so by sort of adding and subtracting poles in, in a relatively straightforward way, you can eventually get some, uh, some ODE essentially that's true. Basically, if you add these green terms to this purple term, you can get something that vanishes not just on the boundary of the unit disk, but everywhere inside the unit disk. And once you have that, I mean, essentially, you could throw this ODE to Mathematica almost, but, but instead what we do is we sort of expand this ODE at a few cho choice points. And somehow the, what makes this nice is that we only actually have to do finite Laurent expansions. So we only need a few terms in these expansions at these points in order to basically be able to characterize uh, what the solutions look like. Okay. And then at that point, it's all really, really uh, quite similar to Akers, Ambrose, Wright, and Cordoba, and Ciso, and Grubick. And so we get the same sort of overhanging and touching waves, uh, depending on which solution we perturb and how careful we are about making sure that it continues to touch. So maybe, let's see, so I have maybe eight more minutes. And so I'll, so in the rest of the talk, I wanna go back and think about global bifurcation again. So let's go back, in fact, to this Konstantin Strauss and Barbaruka paper. So, Again, here's the result. So they construct, or here's a, a you know, a, a inadequate summary of the result, let's say. So they construct a continuous curve of periodic solutions, and one of several things happens. Uh, one thing that is particularly interesting may, might be the self-intersection uh, possibility. 
Um, and still, even though we've constructed some uh, small families of overhanging waves, it's still an open problem whether these particular curves or curves like them uh, contain overhanging waves or touching waves or anything like that. So, so this problem uh, remains open and I think remains a, an interesting and important problem. Um, let me tell you a, another thing ab about this paper. So in, a, in addition to doing this global bifurcation, uh, they reformulate the problem uh, in a much more sophisticated way than what I was showing you a few slides ago. So, so you didn't have a chance to see it because it went by so fast. But essentially, there was, there was nothing particularly deep, um, aside from maybe using that commutator formula for Q that we used. But what they do instead is they, they get, uh, they, yeah, so, so, so I, yeah, it's, it's hard to describe, but essentially they're able to get a very different looking uh, a superficially very different non-local system. So here I've written it in terms of an explicit Fourier multiplier and a single function of a single variable and somehow special cased it to solitary waves so that it looks a little bit cleaner. Um, but this sort of has nice properties. And so uh, in particular in the, their paper, what they say is that uh, it's got certain nice compactness properties that this sort of in terms of the nonlinear operator, and I think also sort of the linearized versions of this nonlinear operator. So while this formulation has many great applications, for instance, to numerics, so, so some of the numerics I was showing you were, were done using essentially this formulation. Um, in the context of this paper, one of their main reasons for doing this is to get certain estimates, basically, um, in, a, in a straightforward way. And so what I want to talk to you about in the last couple minutes, in the last couple slides, is um, an alternate approach to this problem where we basically don't have to do anything particularly sophisticated in order to get these sorts of estimates and compactness things. So, 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 so in some sense, you don't need to be this clever um, in order to get a working global bifurcation theory. Um, so so what, what can you do? Well, again, let's pretend like we're about to, so again, let's use a conformal mapping. So here I'm using the strip as the conformal domain uh, instead of a disk, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and even let's 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 uh, be ambitious and even allow ourselves to have a general uh, vorticity distribution omega depending on psi just just to make this point better. Um, if you just introducing the conformal mapping and using the chain rule, you get this equation at the bottom. There's no, there's 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 nothing clever here. You just do it with the chain rule. So you know, before we used to have one half grad psi squared plus g y, but now that we've changed variables, there's a sort of a chain rule term that appears in the denominator here in terms of the conformal mapping. And previously we had Laplacian psi is omega of psi, but again, we've changed, changed variables from x, y to uh, c, eta. And so we get this a similar looking chain rule term here, but, but, and, and the big bonus is that we fixed the domain to be the strip. So now it's an equation in a fixed domain. And so the, the seemingly new observation is that this system for two real functions, uh, the stream function and one of the, and the imaginary part say of the conformal mapping um, is just on its own an elliptic system. Uh, in the Agmon Douglas Nuremberg sense. And so in particular, it has a lot of nice functional analytic properties, which you can use uh, for global bifurcation. So what are we able to prove using this? So we, we do restrict to constant uh, vorticity uh, in this paper. And we, we also look at solitary waves rather than periodic waves. And we non-dimensionalize in some way that I'm not going to explain, but, but here are the dimensionless equations that we work with at the bottom. And, and here are our three alternatives for the, for the curve. So, so this first alternative is sort of expected. This is the, the, this is the thing that would go to zero if you were having a corner at the crest. Um, this is certainly not a proof that we get corners at the crest, but, but that's what we think this alternative would mean. If, if that happens, we get a corner at the crest. And we know that in some cases you do get corners at the crest. So we're not so uh, beat up about this. The second alternative, so this is a bit weird, gravity going to zero. Really it's not gravity. It's a dimensionless parameter that goes in the gravity slot. It's really like one over a dimensionless wave speed. But in any case, let's, let's call it gravity for now. The gravity goes to zero. And, and this is what's seen uh, by Jean-Marc Vandenbroek in some of his numerics. So we, we believe that, uh, that this alternative can indeed happen for some values of the vorticity. And then finally, we have this condition that the conformal map is somehow degenerating. So you look at the derivative of the conformal map, which is never supposed to vanish because it's a conformal map, uh, but it's actually getting really, really small as you move along this curve. So, so something bad's happening uh, there somehow to do with the geometry of the surface. Okay, um, so this should be compared uh, with the with the other results. So I think very roughly speaking, um, what's going on is that we're replacing this blow up alternative in hold this relatively uh, strong holder space C two plus alpha with this last condition on sort of a sort of uh, uh, this infimum this sort of C one information going to zero. So this is a this is a much stronger statement. 
Um, and indeed, we, we believe that this whole argument and these sorts of statements uh, can be generalized to the periodic case. And indeed, uh, using quite different techniques, uh, Eric Vallein and Jörg Weber in this recent preprint, um, even for general vorticity, have, have something. Uh, they, they have many alternatives, um, because partly because it's a periodic problem and partly because they have a general vorticity, but they also have this as, as one of their alternatives. So, so I won't say anything more about that paper. Uh, because I want to spend the last few minutes just telling you a little bit uh, about this elliptic system formulation because I, I think it's kind of nice. So here's the problem that we have. Um, and we didn't do anything really clever to, to get this. We just sort of followed our nose and did something that had been done a hundred times before. And we sort of are wondering, uh, you know, do we have like shouter estimates for this problem where y and psi are our unknowns? So let's just think about linear shouter estimates to keep things simple. And so let's you know, linearize and throw away all the terms with lower numbers of derivatives. So uh, when we linearize, this is what happens. So the, there used to be some terms on the right-hand side of this Laplacian, but they didn't involve any second partials, so we can basically ignore them. Um, the, this boundary condition here was already linear. This condition here was already linear, so we don't nearly, really need to worry about them. The only thing that's, that's doing something interesting is this dynamic boundary condition up here. So this dynamic boundary condition uh, involved the gradient, this sort of eta psi, the sort of conformal gradient of the stream function, and also this conformal gradient of the conformal mapping itself, essentially. Um, and so when we linearize, we're of course going to get two terms, one with a grad psi and one with a grad y on this left-hand side here. And now the question is, uh, what do we need about these sort of coefficient functions in order to be able to get, say, linear shouter estimates? OK. So it, it's, if you sort of sit and think about sort of trying to semi-decouple these equations for psi and y, it's easy to convince yourself that this coefficient here in front of the grad y is the, is the one you have to worry about. Um, and so the question is, what do we need about this vector field effectively um, in order to get a good shouter estimate? So if you just crack open Gilbarg and Schrodinger, who are, of course, uh, interested or are doing things that work in any number of dimensions, uh, you'll get the impression that you need some sort of uniform obliqueness condition on this vector field. Essentially, you need it to never to be bounded away from being tangential. So say this is, you know, A2 is the vertical component of this vector field A, and we need this never to vanish. So say it's always positive or always negative, and it's bounded below by something. Um, and I think that's probably the best you can do in 3D, but in 2D, uh, you can do significantly better basically for free. So in 2D, in fact, you just need a bound on the psi. You, you just need this vector field to be non-vanishing, and it can wind around as many times as you want. And in fact, there are, there are various theorems about how certain uh, problems, the winding number of this vector field has to do with the Fredholm index of some operator. Um, and, and this is important here, because if you think about what this vector field is doing, for a wave that doesn't overturn, then we are in this good upper case, where this, this vector field turns off, off, out turns out also not to do anything too terrible. But if we have a, a wave that does overturn, which was the whole point of doing things this way with the conformal mapping, uh, then this vector field is going to spin around. And so so being, so being this generalization is important. Um, but once you have this, say by going through the details in Agmon Douglas Nuremberg, but this is written down in many other places, um, then this whole system here doesn't seem so terrible anymore. And sort of this is sort of your foot in the door uh, to do some real analysis and get some global bifurcation. Okay. And that's all I wanted to say, so thanks.